me turn these mics. <laughs> hey, welcome to Look for Lunch, coming at you live. It's November 8th, 2011. It's me, yes. Hugh, and Hilton is here today. Hilton. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Great to see you here today. We were talking about being brief. Yes, we and were. And that, that our time together, at least in this in initial intro, was going to be uh, was going to be brief. Yes. So, my my desire is to have it be brief and great. Okay. So, what's been going on great in your life? Great <laughs> in my life. Well, let's see now. <laughs> mm, where do I begin? <laughs> I remember some great ideas that that we sort of shared. Yeah. Yeah. I was sort of, and like that could keep us busy for a century or so. It, it sure could. <laughs> and things where, you know, we were looking at how do we have our world work a little bit more mm -hmm. effectively. Mm -hmm. And considering that we're at 7 billion population right now. Yeah. You know, and I don't know formally, well, I'll investigate this, but I, I'm quite certain it's not 3.5 billion women and 3.5 billion men. No, th I heard there's like 3 million guys and 4 million women. 4 billion women, yes. Yeah. So, you know, maybe it's time that us guys got together and said, okay, women, we're handing you some leadership that says you bring us along. Yeah, and we came up with a bit of a, uh, a, a bit of an ideology that you know I hope we get to present to the world in 2012. That would be great. I, I I've been saying that for a long time mm -hmm. to women. You know, come on, we've been waiting for mm -hmm. hundreds of years or mm -hmm. whatever for you women to take over. Mm -hmm. When are you going to do it? Mm -hmm. I wonder if that this qualifies as brief and great, and we can. <laughs> 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 Any other brief and great ideas you want? <laughs> um, I think we're good today. Well, oh, let's just tell yes. people what we've got <coughs> coming okay. on the show because we've yes. got uh, Hamish Brooks coming on at about yes. twelve thirty. Yes. But what are we going to be talking about with Hamish? With Hamish, about financial services, you know, uh, specifically commercial financing, and you know how economics are working. So he, he has some very interesting international connections, and uh, we I think we'll learn a bit there. Okay, fabulous. And uh, Anthony's coming on the show. Yes. Yes. And he was on uh, a few weeks ago, um, actually, right? Actually, I think it was um, about two months ago. Yeah. And, and Anthony has become a friend of mine. Yeah. And um, he's been doing a lot of work and, 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 you know, I guess establishing some new tracks for himself. And I guess he's going to be telling us what, what has actually occurred for him and where he's going now, now is even he gonna, more clearly. Is yeah. he going to perform live on I the show today? I think so, today? yeah. Okay, great. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. And Andy Sherwood coming <coughs> on later on. Oh, he's, he's the absolute... I won't even say time management because he'd want to he'd want to shoot me if I said time management. But mm -hmm. the event management, mm -hmm. the priority management, that's the, actually the name of his company, Priority mm -hmm. Management. Mm -hmm. And he helps individuals and corporations manage all the priorities in their life. And the most effective, eloquent way I've ever met. He's a wonderful trainer, has products that support people being organized through his company. And he'll be talking about that and other services and, and workshops that he, that, he, that he runs. Okay, fabulous. So uh, can always... Uh, Use a little more priority management. Absol Everybody, oh boy. right? I am. I I feel like I'm his worst student, but well. you know, he 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 continues to be my friend. Okay, and we're going to start the show off in a couple of minutes with Daniel Bax. Absolutely, right? and, and Daniel has an incredible story, you know, in, of of um, of really winning. You know, when life sends some real shocks to us, mm -hmm. and uh, I met. Uh, I met Daniel less than a year ago, but he, he stuck in my mind, and I had the opportunity to contact him very impromptu, and this magical, you know, real, real time or interview is going to happen. Great. And can't wait to see that. Okay, so we're going <laughs> to do that in just a couple of minutes. And yeah. what's our music today, uh, Theo? Yes, what's our music, Theo? <laughs> we t we're going to play a track of this music right now. And uh, figure out what it is first. Uh -huh. Will it be brief and great? <laughs> <laughs> Not beef and great, brief and Thousand great. Young. Thousand Young. They were here on the Toronto J Show yes. uh, on Friday, and uh, we're going to play their track right now. We're going to be back with Daniel Bax as the lunch gets underway yeah. on a Tuesday. We'll be right back. Perfect.
Welcome back to Liquid Lunch. Uh, and, yes, uh, welcome back. We're here. We've got uh, Daniel Bax joining us here at the table. And Daniel, we were talking, well, you're a speaker and author, but also you do some video stuff. And we were just getting into that, you know, what uh, what you're doing with all this video stuff. It's, you know, let's just jump, jump into it. Uh, with the video stuff, I've done a whole lot yet, but I want to record all my, my speeches. Like I have people that record, help record my, my talks and, and different events I speak at. And then basically from that, Mm -hmm. I'm getting be getting into like a, a video coaching program where I give a certain coaching session out every week and it doesn't matter where you jump in it always applies to your life so I plan on just recording it and doing like little podcasts yeah it's cool yeah. so given that you have this this passion to do this mm -hmm. uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you about your story and how you came to really came to be here today and 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 your life and where it's, you know where it's going from here and some of the things you're you're excited about and bring it on you got it sir so we we met i guess uh less than a year ago at at another music event yes yeah, i think and it was in the spring yes and and i was particularly engaged you know just your smile and you sort of lit up the room and we had a, a wonderful conversation about you know how do how do people do good in the world and 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 live good lives and find meaning yes yeah and uh, i just find one of the biggest things that <coughs> that that <coughs> that I did that I find as people adopt it is just quit dwelling on the past. Mm -hmm. So many people dwell on the past, whether it be something that happened to them last week, yesterday, or ten years ago. They dwell on it, and what's wild is the longer they dwell on it, the heavier it gets, and the more weight it puts on them. Then the story's not even the same when they go to explain it ten years down the road. It's not the same as what it was ten years ago because they just keep building on it, and it builds more trauma, and more chaos, and more havoc in their life. Just. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I say, I say, just be grateful that it happened and, and appreciate that it did happen. Just be grateful for it all and you'll find ways to learn from it mentally, physically, mm -hmm. and spiritually, which ultimately will make you stronger in so many different dim dimensions. Yes. Uh, you seem to have incredible strength. You know, I notice you, 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 you seem to run and muscular. So, like, how did, you, how did you get to do all that? Well, the running part was because I got to run away from my girl before she beats me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> now, why would she want to beat you? Because this mouth runs more faster than I do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the filters, I, I seem to re ruin the filters when the accident. I just ruined the filters. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully maybe something like that will happen on the show here today. But uh, now how did you come to be a speaker and an author? <clears throat> uh, the speaker part, it was, it was even before I could speak because some of my injuries, when I was placed in the hospital, they said I'd never be able to speak again. Because I only have one vocal cord right now, and that I'd be muted forever. So they gave me some kind of vocal amplifier, and I sounded like R2D2. That kind of sucked. I didn't like that for the, for, for even for uh, the first moment. <clears throat> so then I just connected with energy and spirit, and I just started focusing more energy onto my vocal cord, and, and I was able actually able to, to get it to to spring into place. Okay, so that I mean that's a fascinating uh, thing right there, and mm -hmm. let's get into that a little bit more. But first of all, so. You had an. Do you want to tell the story about about your accident, what you were doing before that, and then what happened, and then how it changed? Obviously, changed your life. Certainly, I'll throw it into a real tight synopsis here. It's before I was a, a carpenter, house developer, and builder, and renovator, and I also had a window washing company. So I was kept busy with that anywhere between ten to fourteen hours a day, just playing around because I loved it. It was my passion. I enjoyed mm -hmm. building and developing and designing. Were those Daniel Bax uh, Enterprises, or did they have other names? Yeah, they had other names. Actually, the carpentry company was, was Wilderness Carpentry because I love doing things more natural and, and just as earthy as it could be. And, and then the window washing company was, was uh, more than window cleaning because I did more than window cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> I figured, that's a good name. Why do I keep that? Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> Came out to that one night, and it's probably some kind of stupor, and I figured, I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so going on with that, I figured one day I wanted to get another motorcycle. It's been a while since I had a motorcycle, so I figured I'd go buy another motorcycle. I knew what I was going to take. It was a black, shiny rocket. <laughs> oh, it, just, it, it just screamed, release me. And as I approached it, you could hear it whisper, I dare you. Oh. So as soon as I got on the bike, my inner thoughts kicked in. They said, I hope nobody hits me. I, Definitely don't want to scratch the rocket. So to avoid heavy traffic, I took off towards the back roads. Now in the back roads, loving the fresh air, loving the freedom, and just tearing it up. Came upon a row of cars slowing down up ahead of me. That's when Eagle kicked in and said, 
just blow on by. So as I sped up faster and faster at 130, 140 kilometers an hour, I was firing on by and bam, the front van pulled out and I fired right through the back window. Momentum ripped me out and threw me up over the street light 30 feet in the air and equally as far down the road where I came down and landed face first. Obliterating my helmet, my body, and yeah, I scratched the bike. I have to pay for that. So very fortunately, the EMS was in the area, came and scraped me off the ground, placed me in the back of the ambulance where they took off towards local hospital where I technically died en route to the hospital. From air, there, airlifted to a trauma unit hospital, rushed straight in to 10, 10 surgeries in just 14 hours, dying additional four times. And do, when, do you remember any of that? It's interesting, but I clearly remember a lot of it. I remember the vehicles, I remember what they looked like. When I got out and they got me to read the accident report, they actually was speaking to them about what happened, what the incident was like, and what the cars looked like, the color of them, and the people that were in them, and how many there were. He goes, oh, you must have read the accident report. I said, I haven't seen it yet. What is the accident report? So he told me and he gave it to me, and it was almost verbatim. What's wild is, is I was completely colorblind prior. And how are you supposed to remember anything? But see, your subconscious is, is like a photo machine. It just takes mm -hmm. pictures of what's mm -hmm. there, and you get more of a present, real-time image. Mm -hmm. are you I'm just curious, are you still colorblind? Or? I can see some colors, but for the most part, it's, it's black and whites. I tell colors by shades. Okay. All right. All right. Yes. So that's a horrific story. So um, what happened? Yeah, then? what happened? Well, when I came out of that, they now just imagine, place yourself in these shoes. A head nurse comes to you and says, your fellow loved one would never walk again because they're paralyzed. They were talking again, eats all the foods, ever moved their left side, likely won't remember anything before the accident, including you. Because he's going to be a vegetable. He might as well just plug him in. We're going to have him plugged in. You've got to put him in a bed, and he's going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life. So, so the nurse told that to who? They came in and told that to my family. So imagine right. they said that to you. Yeah, and you were in there. Do you remember <coughs> that moment, or were you I was, I was, I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't speak at the time. Yeah. Could, could barely feel it in my body, except for parts of my right side. And, and, and I got it. And what I, I remember saying to him, I, I said to my mom, I asked my mom after, I said, Mom, did I say this? But well, I'm going to tell you in a moment. And she goes, Daniel, you didn't say a thing. You couldn't even mumble a moan at that time. There was no voice coming out of you. I said, well, I said it so loud, I heard it echo in the room. She goes, you didn't say a thing. What it was, it probably echoed upstairs because when I landed face first in the accident, I probably I compressed my brain now. There's lots of room up there. <laughs> so the, what I was speaking, I just heard echoes. But well, basically, I looked at the surgeon I, or the head nurse, and I said, thank you for all that you've done. But I will do everything you said you can't. Those are your opinions, and I will not allow your opinions to become my reality. If the good Lord created me, he'll fix me. Thank you. You said that to her or, you, or I, in your mind? In or? my mind, I, like, that's why I said I said to my mom, I said, I said it so loud. Mom goes, no, you didn't say it at all because I couldn't speak at the time. So I said it so oh. loud upstairs. That I heard it. You thought you. I thought I clearly thought that I spoke at that time. That I told him that. And then while I was going with energy and going with spirit, I looked over at my mom just the, the half inch I could turn, and I nodded at her, saying, "Okay, let's go." She came and grabbed my wheelchair and wheeled me out of the room right then. And as I looked at him and I went like this, I just nodded like to say, "Thank you. We'll see you later." He looked and nodded back and said, "I'm sorry. There's nothing more we can do." This was how long after your accident? Uh, they rolled me in there. I was in the coma for 10 days, so that would have been within the first, probably the first two months. My goodness. How long ago was this accident? August 30th, 2005. It was at about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. <coughs> what a journey. It's been a journey, yes. <laughs> so then what, okay, so you were, you were in the wheelchair at this point. Did you have to stay in the hospital much longer? Or what was the, you know, what, pay, uh, tell us the story of how you came to where you are now from that? I was in that hospital, I think, ICU, I was in there for several weeks, if not a few Which months. Which was the first, first hospital that uh, took Hamilton you Hamilton General, they flew me into Hamilton General, and then right. I was in ICU for a few weeks, and then I think in that <coughs> hospital for another nine months, which was the longest place I've ever been in anywhere. Then the next hospital was actually down here on University Avenue, Toronto Rehabilitation Institution. Yeah. I was in there for seven months, and I was in a wheelchair. It was basically enough to see what, if, what they can, where, what, where, you, where are you going to go next? So that was the place that they work with you to get you a little bit further. Then from there, I spent time in two, if not three, different rehabilitation facilities, live-in facilities. But each time I went there, 
I got out faster because I advanced beyond their ability to, to work with me, they'd move me to the next facility. When they rolled me out and they rolled me into, I was just learning how to speak. At the, at the first hospital, I just started moving my, my leg when they said, well, my foot was never going to move. So my mom was in there dressing my wounds on my leg. And I was pointing down on my foot with the only arm that moved, my right arm, and I was like this. And, and my full expression, the right eyebrow, because the left side was completely paralyzed from eyebrow to toe. She looks down at my foot and goes, what, honey, what? So I'm pointing at my foot, couldn't say a word, pointing at my foot. She goes, just a moment, honey, let me just take care of this. She finished dressing my wound, looks at me again, and goes, what, honey? Here's what I have to ask you guys. <clears throat> Whenever you go to attempt something, how many times do you attempt it before you give up? On average, do you, do you find you, if you don't accomplish it the first time, do you go back and attempt it again? Yes. Yeah. Would you continue doing that until you made it happen, or would most times you back out and say, I'll do it later? After a dozen or two dozen or a couple of dozen times, it's sort of like, okay, I, I'm done. <laughs> You've had enough. <laughs> yeah. Most people give up after the first few tries. And they say it's just not worth it or it's not, <clears throat> it's not me, the stars aren't aligned or whatever the, the reasons mm -hmm. are. And so <clears throat> as, as mama was just talking to me and doing what she's doing, I knew that I had done something with that foot before. I just knew it. So I look back down at it and I focus more attention, more energy and more determination than I think I've ever had in my entire life back at that foot and just say, this is my foot, this is my toe. Mom looks down there and I point it back down again. I looks at it and she goes, I go like this. Daniel, do it again, do it again, do it again. Nothing. Again, try it again and again and again. She looked back at me, come on, you gotta, you gotta do it again. You gotta see do it again. Tried again and again and I don't know how many more times but then I went like this. And then from that, it went into my toes and my ankles over time into my leg and to just moving my body. And it was still numb, I couldn't feel it, but I knew that I'd be able to move it. So I just began focusing on what was next after... After each success. After each success. So yeah. it was really just like, uh, it almost sounds like it's sheer determination and, and just a, a complete unwillingness to give up. That's one of the, you're, you're very right there. And that's one of the big things is determination will, but I find the main, the foundational material of it all was faith. Not so much faith in the Creator or God, Allah, Zen, Krishna, whatever, but faith in yourself. Yeah. Because if you have faith in yourself as to what you can do and knowing that you mm -hmm. will do it, it doesn't matter how long it is or how much, how hard it is, you will accomplish it. Yeah. Now, where do you think that faith that you had comes from? Because there might be people out there that are dealing with situa uh, similar situations or might one day, right, and they might not have the faith that you had to do it. So first of all, where did you get your faith from? And what would you tell somebody else who's dealing with a situation like that? Where I got it from? That's an interesting and tricky question. It's <clears throat> At that moment, I think a lot of it was, was just, because I was, my brain was so kiboshed that I was at a <laughs> basically a juvenile level. I was reborn. I had to learn how to scratch and itch and move and everything from blinking an eye to everything. It was all, I was reborn. And it's like a child, if you tell them they can't walk, they're going to keep going and going and going and going and going because they just have that faith. It's like a, a childlike mentality saying, if you put something on a counter and you say you can't have that and you discipline and put it on the counter, they'll find a way flipping pots and pans over, sitting on stools, standing on their brother's head just to get what they want to get off the counter. They'll mm -hmm. find a way to get it because they're determined. Mm -hmm. So with myself, and if I share that out there with anybody else, it's just the faith that you've got to have in yourself is a sure determination that you will get it. Knowing that you will. No second guessing it. No, don't worry about what people say, what their, their opinions of what they think you can do or you can't do. Most opinions of what people give you are basically opinions of what they think they can do. Mm -hmm. So basically they're basing their opinion on you. And they're saying, well, you can't do that. So with faith, just know you will. And it's time and, and energy and determination that will ultimately bring it through and, and shine, let you show that you can. You know, it's almost like, uh, I, I, I kind of know what you're talking about, but for somebody who doesn't know, per se, right, you know, where do they get that knowing from? And they, they, they you know, all these self-help things say, you got to know, you got to have that. 
The knowing. The knowing of it. And, but for somebody that doesn't know, you know, it's almost as if that knowing is, is something that comes not from you. You know, somebody like through grace or whatever gives you that knowing. That's where I step into, if, if you want to put a, a bit of a spot or a, or a, like, have a spot where you point at it and say, okay, I got it from here. It's because I had so much faith in who I was and faith in the Creator that I knew that something will happen. As, and as I said, in the, I call it the, the human instruction manual, the Bible. As you give, you shall receive. And he <coughs> goes, I created you in my image. And if I'm created in his image, and he's done all of this, and created this entire universe and yeah. all the other things that are around there, and created the most fascinating machinery on earth, the human. Yeah. Yeah. If he did all that, and I'm creating his image, and if I can only do 10% or a tenth of that, mm -hmm. what could yeah. I do? What's yeah. possible? Yeah. So I just sat there in faith, okay? If he did that, and that scripture kept on rolling into my head, I created you in my image. Have faith, Daniel. So I figured, okay, if that is so, then what I'll do is I'll just begin believing so intensely and so strongly that it's going to happen. That even after all the failures of trying to make things move or trying to make things work, just knowing. Yeah. It's, it's, the faith is in the knowing. Just yeah. So you didn't know how, but you were determined to discover what could be done with yeah. the gifts that you had. You know, all of them, including yeah. what seems to have been problems or, or horrific challenges. Yeah. And, and I'm just curious, you mentioned you were reborn, and I'm just wondering, was there a brain injury? Or ha is you, are you a different person now? I mean, in, in a sense, your life is different, but are you essentially a different person now than you were before the accident? I'll say yes to both. The head injury was so massive, they, that's why I, I died additionally f three times during surgery, because the brain just kept on quitting, just kept on quitting. Yeah, there's a Glasgow coma scale they rate you on from, I think it's like the highest, I don't recall exactly what it is right now, but your lowest you can go is, is Glasgow coma scale of three. After that, you're in casket. I was at a Glasgow coma scale of three for the first two weeks. I completely erased all of my memory. I had to learn how to speak again, learn how to scratch an itch, learn to go to the bathroom, everything. English language, I learned English language again. So everything from my communication to my motor skills had to all be retrained. And did you get your memory back, your, your long-term? Not all of it, but I've been very blessed that I've got a stimulated memory where, <laughs> like, like actually, Helen and I were on the way over here, and I don't re really recall a, a lot of what we spoke about or even meeting the cat. And then all of a sudden we get in the car and he says something, and that just triggers, like, it's like a slideshow, brrr, all of a sudden all these images come back. Mm -hmm. Says something again, brrr, more images come back. So now I clearly remember sitting with him at a table <laughs> talking about what we spoke about. Well, not clearly, but, mm -hmm. so that's where the stimulated memory comes in is that when we're connected and talking about something, if you mm -hmm. say something or, like say, I had a dog that used to run with me all over the place and was, was technically my, my best friend. But I didn't remember that dog at all until a gentleman that was living in a building that I was living in had a, a seeing eye dog, you know, it was a black lab. Mm. Dog tweaked his eyebrows, cocked his head, ears moved. <laughs> More images came. It's like, I see this brown dog. I sniffed my hand, the air against my hand. <laughs> More images. Interesting. Then I pet the dog because he let me pet it, so I pet the dog. And all of a sudden, more images. After that, I had to call to my friend. I said, did I have a, a chocolate lab? She goes, yeah, you did. And when she started telling me about things, all of a sudden, all the other images of when the dog would travel with me, when I go to bike races or I go camping or hiking, all of a sudden, all these images came back with this dog. So I have a clear memory, and it's, it's like a photographic memory of that animal mm. and all the, all the scenarios. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So, so uh, and, and of course, your career's changed because uh, you were doing uh, carpentry work yes. and stuff before. Now you're, doing, you're, you're speaking. And you've got a book that you've written. Is it coming out in the new year? Is the book is right now is down at the editors, and he's just editing. He's going through editing up with the, the manuscript and beginning the first half of the book. And that will be released in the early, sh I'm not exactly sure the time, but in early first half of 2000, what are we in, 11? 2012. Mm -hmm. Can you share the title? Yeah. The title I'm going to be called, it will be called the life, of, the life You Choose. 
And can you give us, uh, uh, that's an intriguing title, um, what's, can you kind of distill the essence of, of the book for us? The today? essence of it. The life you choose could potentially go into the life of your choice, but either way, it's all sort of the same thing. So it's basically, are you choosing to live your life or exist in it? Are you choosing to be a victim of a scenario or to be victorious? Are you choosing to see a missed opportunity as failure or as a possibility for something greater? So it's everything in life is a balance of how we look at it. Do we see ourselves as, as winning or failing because we've experienced so much trauma? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all a choice. And, and going through there, I break it down. I think I got 28 chapters in there. And I break it down each chapter. I give the essence of the chapter. Then I give an example of that chapter. Then I will give my personal experience. Then I give them an exercise. So it's not like you read a book and you go through and it's like, oh, it was a really good book and you put it down and you're done. Mm -hmm. This one here, you get to implement and facilitate your life into constructing that chapter as <coughs> part of a habit in your life. So it becomes more habitual instead of just something you read one day and a few things stick. And uh, you also uh, are speaking to, who, who, do you, who, do you, who do you normally speak to and, and what, what do you share with people? I speak on, a lot of it is on just human potential and possibility. And I go through medical rehabilitation facilities, through hospitals, I do some in-services where I speak from, with the doctor, with their staff. They have people that come in and speak to them every week, so I go in and talk about communication, how they can communicate and connect. So I'm like a facilitator between them and, 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 the, and the thriver. And then if I go into different facilities, I'll speak with the the, the workers and, let, and give them the power of the word as I'm speaking with the, the thrivers, giving them the, showing them possibility and the power of the word. So when they go in there and they go back to, to rehab and they connect with their, their caretaker, they're not sharing stuff. The caretaker goes, ah, you're got a wild imagination, but let's just focus on this. That's mm -hmm. fancy thinking, but what's the chance of that? So if I work with the, anybody, it doesn't matter what area I speak in, where I work with them and connect them with the power of the word and how powerful it is when you state something and you put I am in front of it, it becomes you. Mm -hmm. That ultimately, like, if you look at, let's just use a quick scenario right here. <clears throat> you got the word impossible. I'm sure we've all said it. We've also heard it many times, right? Let's take that word impossible for a moment. Now I get back to this where I was talking about, otherwise I get myself lost. Take the word impossible and separate the first two letters and say those first two letters and then say the last part of the word. <laughs> what do you have? I am possible <laughs> very nice just in stating that word it nullifies the meaning <clears throat> that the dictionary gives it if you say it like that <clears throat> so with the word impossible when someone says that's impossible all i see is i am possible so it becomes a declaration that i'm going to overcome and become and do so much more not to prove you wrong just to prove to myself that i can that mm -hmm. i am possible <clears throat> daniel yes. it, it seems to me from our conversation that it's not just mind and our brain that's doing that, at, at least with you, perhaps for all of us. But there's something we spoke, you ended up calling me uh, on your way down here. Yes. And, and let's just talk about that, because I was just amazed. <laughs> yeah, that, that was wild. It's connecting with, with, with spirit. When, when it's like when, when I give you a scenario, and I'll use it again. Like you walk by something, you see a pencil on the floor, and you go, oh, that got to be picked up. But you don't pick it up, you walk on and say, I'll get that later. Well, it's being conscious and being alert of when, when spirit tells you to do something, to actually taking action on it and being mm -hmm. proactive in, in, in your, in your <coughs> set, like, mindset. Because how many times do you hear people say, I thought of that. I knew I should have done that. Man, I, th I just thought about that 10 minutes ago and somebody else does it. Yeah. If you didn't pick that pencil up yeah. and you were going to pick it up later, yeah. possible reason why is because you go into the next room, someone gives yeah. you a phone call, yeah. and now you need to write it down. You got no pencil pick it up you would have had in your hands so what happened today you were riding the subway down you're gonna come down here on your own yes. we were gonna try and find each other what happened got on the subway and it says give Hilton a call let him know you're gonna be a little bit behind it's like I'm in the subway I'm underground phone never works wait what was that just a, a message in your head and in my head it says you got to give Hilton a call and I know that the subway surfaces at certain times yeah it surfaces so I can make a quick call and the call will be say 30 40 seconds and back underground again 
so I just said, yeah, I'll get him at the next. You said spirit, sort yeah. of said, for you to yeah, call. Spirit, you were wondering, going, no, this said, doesn't make any sense. And I looked around. I looked at the guy standing at the back of the bus. I was up at the front so I can see where, where we're going. And I looked around. I was like, nah, we're in a tunnel. Daniel, give him a call. <clears throat> ah, you know, what the heck? <laughs> That's always worth a try. So I pulled the phone out of the back pocket, look at it. No <laughs> bars. Nothing. I was like, this is not going to work. So I go to the message. Hilton left me a message. And I just hit the call back button. Turn my earbud on, hit the callback button. You wouldn't believe when it started ringing. <laughs> it rang. I was like, Hilton, yeah, I'm going to be running a little bit behind. And I'm on my way down. Just towards the Rosedale subway station, you said. And, and I'm just coming upon the Rosedale subway station. And then Hilton says, that's funny. That's incredible. I'm right around the corner. I stopped in to see my, <laughs> to see my wife at the nursing home. And you know, she's gravely ill. And, and I was leaving, I, but I made an emergency stop because you know, I, just was, I just wanted to do that. Spirit told you to. Yeah. And, and, and I was really deba deba debilitating not doing it because time was so tight. And I finally just said, okay, I'm just going to do it. I just feel like I have to. So I ended up being a block away from you. Which actually goes back to the beginning in the morning. Yes. You wanted to go. And then what were you told to by wife and what were you told to from Spirit? Yes. Yeah. Wife said, don't go. You know, just go to your, go to your interviews. And, and I went, okay, because that was the second communication with her. Wife said, don't come. And I wasn't going to go. And then I was going into the car, and last minute I said, no, I just got to go. I just feel like I'm supposed to. Like I heard that I'm supposed to go. And, and I attended to her. And, and just as I was leaving uh, in the car, I get the call from Daniel, and he's a block away. And, I'm, and had that not occurred, I would have been 20 blocks away. Mm -hmm. And so had that I not occurred, I would have wow. been 20 minutes away in the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would, this, this wouldn't have been happening. Wow. So we both listened. And you, what did you say about that? There's no coincidence. It's it coincides. Coincidence is something that coincides with, with the thoughts and with spirit. It's meant to be. It's meant to happen. We're supposed to be here. Yeah. I'm so supposed Daniel, to be here with you yeah. guys. I'm supposed to connect with Hilton. Yeah. So Daniel, sure I, want, I want to just thank you for being a sort of you know, a giant in spirit and listening and paying attention. You're causing me to look to do that much more so. Thank you. That's stillness. That's just means awesome. a lot. Yes. Uh, and Daniel, if people want to get in touch with you, maybe they want to buy the book when it comes mm. out, because uh, it does sound like uh, mm. a central reading for almost anybody, or, or get you to, to be a speaker at uh, one of their events. The what? best way they can connect with me is through the, the website, and that's Daniel, my name, Daniel, D-A-N-I-E-L, at Daniel Back Speaks, which is my website, and my last name is B-A-X dot C-A or dot com. Either way, it's the same. So danielbackspeaks.com would be the website? Yes, yes, or okay. .ca. And, and again, the, um, the email, daniel at danielbackspeaks.com? That is correct, yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming in. Today. One last thing. I, I, I'm just compelled to, to do this. For, and it, that smile of yours. <laughs> yeah. When I went to pick you up at the subway station, not having seen you for half a year, I said, just look for the silver car. I saw this man come out of the subway station in, 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 in the shorts and, and, and short sleeves. <laughs> you know, and, I'm, hmm. and, 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 and I thought, no, that can't be him. And I was looking. And, 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 uh, and, and I wasn't even going to approach you. I backed the car up and, you know, hmm. And then I saw this smile. All right, you, I guess you saw, saw me and I saw this smile. And like, it just changed. And I want to just acknowledge you for that because when, that, you. when you smile, you just light up like, you know, life is, is what a great discovery. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, uh, and, and really for all of us, I think that there's, all of us have a smile that's, you know, just one that's glowing from the inside. We do. We all have, we're all filled full of love, energy, and just a vibrant source of, of peace. <laughs> that if we tap into ourselves and what we're really here for, we're really here to give and, and to be in love and be loved and just to connect. When we know that, we're doing that and we're, 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 we're connecting with people, whether it be our kids, our, our lovers, our family, friends, whatever it is, we illuminate. So just picture your life and see every day that you're going to connect, even if it's not in the schedule to do that, that you will. And you'll begin to carry, you'll begin to resonate a, an energy, a glow about you that will draw people, places, events, and opportunities into your life that will make things happen. I'm so excited for your journey. Thank you for connecting. Thank you for allowing me to connect. Okay. All right. Thank you. So let's take a little break, Hilton, and we're going to come right. back with Hamish Brooks uh, as the lunch continues on a Tuesday. We'll be right back.
Hey, we're back here on Liquid Lunch, and uh, we got Hamish Brooks joining us here at the table. And uh, I guess, uh, Hilton, you've known Hamish for a while. Do you want to just introduce us to our... Yes, new friend Hamish, uh, Hamish Brooks. And, and, and in doing all the good things you do in the, in, in the world and finance, I thought this would be a wonderful time for you to, to tell even more people. Yeah, definitely. I've <laughs> uh, been involved in um, finance for the past five years. Actually, it's business development for a company called... Celtic um, Division. Um, What's it called? Celtic? Celtic Division. K-E-L-T-I-C. Celtic Division. I have an accent, by the way, in case you didn't recognize that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of accent? That's a Scottish accent. Okay, yeah. Scottish. All right. Yeah. Second language is actually English. <laughs> <laughs> Does anything else go with the Scottish action? Is there uh, action? Not action. Accent. Is there uh, Scottish dancing? Or what are the uh, other I Scottish I habits? I, I do. Um, I used to do table dancing with a kit on as well <laughs> for, certain, for certain clients. And there's, there's nothing underneath that, is there? Well, that would be against the law. <laughs> <laughs> so well That would be, so be against Scottish law to uh, oh. <laughs> dance with something underneath your kilt. Right, okay. And do you play the bagpipes, just asking? No, I don't play the bagpipes. No, I need lots of air to in order to play yeah. bagpipes. Okay, yes. Uh -huh. All right, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, just curious, so d when did you come to Canada? I came to Canada 33 years ago. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and how has it been? Well, kind of been very good to me. I've worked for some good companies here. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would rate Canada as one of the best countries in the world to live in. Mm -hmm. and Why I do you say that? Well, I, the um, the opportunities here are, are very very high. If yes. you work hard and um, you can get get yourself ahead pretty fast, mm -hmm. and if you have a um, good attitude as well, and you know how to treat people the same way mm -hmm. as you want to treat yourself, yes. and life can be very good here. I've lived in um, Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia, yes. and I've benefited well in every one of those provinces. You know, I, I, I remember once I was working with uh, a guy that uh, moved to Canada from Scotland, and he yeah. told me that one of the reasons he came here was because of the weather. He said the weather was better here than in Scotland. Well, you know, we don't have really have six months of winter, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and my little chuckles aren't freezing off if I was, if I was back home just now. <laughs> uh, here, my, my buns are always freezing <laughs> for six months of the year. <laughs> yeah. So how did you get into this, uh, this business, the business development business? I got into business. business development um, actually over, over 10 years ago. Um, uh, a gentleman I came across who was doing investment properties and um, business development actually sent me out on five um, presentations to uh, speak to people about um, certain finances and finding capital for them and um, showed me the best way to do it and so I had a great attitude at speaking to people yeah. and bringing the best out of people and finding out what they really want. Okay, so now what were you doing, just curious, before you got into this? I was an operation manager for both Dominion stores and for um, Safeway Foods in the, east, in the west coast of Canada. Okay. And uh, so what does your job consist of on a day-to-day -day basis now? Like what's your day? What do you, what well, your days look like? Well, just to like? backtrack that, I'm also associated with um, Lloyds Bank Investment Properties. Lloyds Bank, where I, um, I hold uh, a temporary license. Um, they um, do investment properties in 11, in 11 different countries, but my main focus here is to find um, money for people that have projects for um, both um, business development and other projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there specific projects that you know really attract you, or what? What is the criteria for you to look well, at a project? Well, the criteria there is if you've got um, a, a reasonably good. Um, and business plan and it's extra summary yep. and um, it has lots of potential then I have people definitely look at the, the whole project. Okay. And you, you know when you're talking about so you d in a sense you represent investors or angel investors? Or I represent um, te technically I represent Triman Capital to a certain extent 
and I, I represent um, angels investors as well. I'm also associ associated with a company called um, the Export Club, which actually um, promotes um, trade amongst its members. Okay, interesting. And um, how do you find uh, investors are are what's their outlook these days? Everybody's you know seems every every day there's a new potential crisis in Europe or somewhere and uh, you know people are wondering which way the economy is going to go what's you know in the people you're dealing with what are they what's their well uh, a lot of investors that um, look at quite a number of my projects they're looking for a good return on their money just like everybody else so most of these investors are looking for a return anywhere from 8 to 12 percent now are the angel investors the same in that sense or uh, angel investors are t technically, um, they're the certain kinds of people that have, um, one, they could be retired angels investors, where they're looking to help people to um, move forward on their business plan and their mm -hmm. projections as well. But they want a return too. Right? Yeah, they want a return. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes their return is a little bit lower than um, a guy that's um, looking for the, the largest return possible. Maybe lower, maybe a little more long term as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. With a higher, um, a higher equity stake. Where? Yeah. 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 They're looking for um, their projection over um, three to five years. Mm -hmm. They want to try and get as much out of the um, out of their money as they possibly can. Yes. But that's pretty common nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there like one story that stands out in your mind, is in your career, finding these companies' money that's a real, uh, a real positive uh, or, or stands out for you? Yeah, we just now I'm working on a, a program, and the, the money's now in place. I'm working on a program um, to build um, a high-end condominium up in the surf. And it's going to be the largest and um, tallest building between um, Toronto and British Columbia. Where is it going to be? Up in the Sioux. The Sioux Saint Marie. Sioux Saint Marie. Yeah. Sorry, I, like I told you, I don't speak English. What? <laughs> That's second language. So how tall will this will this uh, tallest the building will be? Forty stories high. Wow. And um, the first stage of the 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 first stage of the money is actually um, they are sitting waiting for them. They have already. Um, on the second stage just now where <coughs> I have uh, a core builder which will work with the actual builders and help to develop this project. And there may also be some native Indian, native people involved in this project as well. Sounds and very exciting. Yeah. Up in the Sioux, we're not telling you exactly how it's going to be built, but up in the Sioux, the, um, the mayor of that particular area, because it's close to the border between um, the US of A and Canada um, they're ecstatic about this project being completed well I think I would be too if I were the mayor of Sault Ste. Marie but absolutely uh, the tallest building between Ontario and BC that, that's and I, I visited Sault Ste. Marie once many decades ago and yeah. and 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 I it's basically didn't think I ever would but would like a good excuse to go visit it again yeah. and maybe even you know come to know it but this is really exciting you know well, the way this will it be a commercial residential or, or a mixed-use complex commercial and mostly residential there's yes. three billionaires just now already bought penthouses well, already on in the, the Sioux uh, up in the Sioux is Phil Esposito one of them <laughs> uh, <laughs> could be I don't think so <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, like yeah. a financial expert spoke But the, the actual building too will actually glow in the dark as well. It will glow in the dark? And it will glow in the dark. And it won't have, it will have such a figure on it, not like a Marilyn Monroe figure, but it will have a figure on it that you won't believe. I hope it's not, no, I won't say it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> or just so imagine the project's it being actually worth about 200 to 300 million dollars. Wow, that's great. Um, now, what are you looking for now? Like, are you looking for uh, investors to work with? Are you looking for peop uh, businesses that are looking for money? W oh, I'm looking, I'm looking for people that have projects and a reasonably good credit rating, and they're looking for money. And um, 
I've got access to um, certain investors that will bring money to the table. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's great. Yeah. All right. And now, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, Hamish, uh, what's the best way for them to do yeah, that? The best way is either go through Trayman Capital. Did, did, what's their website? Their website is www.triamancapital.com. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just um, put a note on there for Hamish. Yes. H-A-M-I-S-H. And my email is Celtic51 at live.com. K-E-L-T-I-C. 51 at live.com okay any final thoughts for us Hamish great to have this conversation but do you have any final words of wisdom you want to leave people with um, look after your credit rating it's one of the most important things to do in life okay all right Hamish okay. thank Thanks you so much Hamish. thank you so uh, so uh, Hilton let's just take a little break and we're gonna come yes. back uh, Anthony's here mm -hmm. brought his guitar we're gonna have some live music some live performance and yes, it's gonna yes. be awesome so we'll be right back perfect Okay.
And welcome back to Liquid Lunch. And we're here with Andy Sherwood here. And we're going to be talking about priority management, which is more than the name of the company. It's also a lifestyle. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And you live it and walk it. We met, what, I don't know, a quarter century ago or something like that. Back when we were six or seven years old. Exactly. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you took away what I thought I had earned. I thought I was your absolutely worst student. And you just said, no, no, no. This part. So like, now, now I'm going to have to work on becoming your best. Like, you know, exactly. Because like, oh. you know, like I, I can't imagine being worse than this, so I have to do something different. You're far, you're far too hard on yourself. <laughs> So the, uh, when we first came together, it was under the, under the context of this brand that you operate and uh, called Priority Management. Right. And it's how to manage all our priorities. And you know, uh, would you like to talk about that and, and well, what you're doing now? And same thing, actually, basically. The only difference is where when we first met, we did it using dead trees, uh -huh. a paper-based system. Now it's all digital. But the basic concepts of best practices mm -hmm. for knowledge workers. So part of this is understanding what's a knowledge worker. The word work for most of history is connoted physical labor. We're the first generation or the cohort in the history of the planet where the economy is based on knowledge and communications, not physical toil. Now because of that, we're still in the infancy of understanding productivity, effectiveness, work-life balance for knowledge workers. But that's been the genre of Hilton from day one. Yes. Which is best practices for executives, managers, salespeople, marketing people, professionals, radio personalities. Think of the desk, a perfectly clean desk, an empty inbox, all to-dos in one place, and the average person has their to-dos in 14. A plan for the day, simplistic but realistic. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things you recall is how do you remember something that hasn't yet happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, how do you, you, you need a special machine for that? Or <laughs> well, it, but it, start, it's, it gets into the c concept of the fact that we have a lot of to-dos. We have things, meetings, appointments that will be tomorrow, the next day, next week. We've got, quote, things to do, mm -hmm. by definition in the future. And one of the things I try to stress with people is that the human brain was designed to remember from the past, not into the future. So one of the issues is said in an incredibly complex society that we've, there's a dinner tonight at 6.30, a workshop tomorrow at 9, and a, and a whole bunch of things that I need to do. How do we remember those? Mm -hmm. And the issue is that the way we do it is we train ourselves to constantly be reviewing. Got to remember, mustn't forget. Got to remember, mustn't forget. Got to remember, mustn't forget. 4 o'clock in the morning, like a rifle shot going off. Oh, my gracious, I almost forgot I need to. Mm -hmm. The stress is high for some people. So that's the first thing. And understanding that the ability to remember into the future is inversely proportional to our intelligence. So the smarter you are, the harder it is. To remember to-dos. Hence the figure of speech, the absent-minded professor. Okay. These are men and women with IQs in the top 1% who can remember like a steel trap from the past. Right. They remember passages, they're incredibly good at creating, but they're actually slightly worse than the average person at remembering that dinner tomorrow night is 6.30, that they need to phone the dean on Friday. And that's a scientific established Absolutely. fact. Okay. Is it a perfect line? No. Right. But, and, it's, and our ability to remember into the future is inverse of to our age. As we get older, there comes a point in our 30s, 40s when we think we're losing our minds. Mm because we're now starting to forget to-dos. We're also mm -hmm. subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. Revered in the industry, we know things. Mm -hmm. So then you say, well, what do people do? Well, they write it down. Every, I write it down. And I say, yeah, where? <laughs> and then I go in and I take a look. They've got an inbox with 400 emails in it, a bunch of which they still need to do. They've got an in-basket with a bunch of to-dos. They've got post-it notes on their computer screen so they can tell people they use their computer for time management. Then they have a to-do list. Everybody's told make a to-do list. Wrong. It's not a to-do list, it's a work in progress list that's never prioritized. Then we supplement that with files, letters, documents all over the desk. Yeah. It works, uh -huh. but it's tragic how hard people work. And what could be so simple? Clean desk, empty inbox, all to-dos in one place, and some form of a system. There's dozens. But that when you say to me, Andy, call me in a week's time, I need to be able to create a task, call Hugh. Start date, a week today, 15th. And then it needs to vanish until next week. Mm -hmm. Now once you put it to do in a place the brain trusts, mm -hmm. the brain thinks it's done. Mm -hmm. And the brain stops all this, mm -hmm. gotta remember, mustn't forget. 
and peacefulness and serenity. <laughs> Seriously, but you need seriously, to have you're, that. You're laughing, but you're. But I'm dead serious. No, mm -hmm. but but you need to. Whatever your system is, it exactly. needs to. Absolutely. It needs to deliver when you. So Absolutely. your brain doesn't have to do it. Exactly. Right. And what that is, it can be, you know, again, the genre of daytime invented in 1941. But there's a variety nowadays. It's it's a variety of things. It can be a BlackBerry. It can be an iPhone. Outlook is incredible. Absolutely amazing. But impossible for the normal person to figure out how to use it. But yes, to answer your question. Absolutely, there needs to be a system, mm -hmm. not a scattered, disjointed, haphazard methodology, but a system. Then life is easy. Now, so do, 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 does your company provide that system for yeah, people? Yeah, I run workshops on a constant okay. basis. One day workshops on knowledge, worker productivity, work-life balance. Benefit the average person will increase productivity roughly an hour a day. We either make more money, get promoted quicker, do the job quicker and go home. Their call. Two, they stay focused on what matters for a life well lived. Mm. The value of life is not its length that the use made of it. And wasting time isn't murder, it's suicide. So let's at least look at the end of the day and say, did I spend my time on what matters most? Mm -hmm. Did things slip through the cracks? Which is a negative on our professionalism. Causing increased stress, those are the benefits. But yes, I run the workshops you know, a couple of times a week. What are the on, 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 and we teach it again, as I mentioned, we teach it using a paper-based system, but the vast majority now is using you know, the organizations that are using either Outlook or occasionally Lotus Notes. Do you think there's still room out there for a tool? Because you mentioned I Outlook is amazing, but people don't use it. You know, is there a room out there for some for a tool that is going to give people exactly what they need and it's going to be easy that they'll actually use it? Uh, it's, you see, Outlook when we're done with it, is simple. The question is getting people to do something, and that's a wonderful thing. It's simple, but not easy. So it's simple. Yeah. Is it easy? Well, you actually have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> change patterns and behaviors. Right. And Which is not nuclear physics, but it's recognizing that it's not that difficult using whatever methodology once we understand the logic behind it, Hugh. Right. So what's on a desk? When I yeah. go in and say, well, there's, th there's three things on a desk, garbage, that people won't throw out, pathological hoarders. Information, nothing needs done at the moment. Information belongs in a file, not a pile, or it represents work I still need to do, none of which is a valid reason to have it piled out on the top of the desk. So the, 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 the tools exist. Do we need another one? No, we need understanding on how to use them and we need the discipline to, to, go, to use to them. Do it. And discipline sets us free. Interesting. Anyway. How did you get into this? Like what's your story, how you got interested in priority management? Maritimer, grew up down east, so far back in the woods we had to come out to hunt. Like where? And like all little <laughs> New Brunswick, and like good Maritimers, if you've seen the movie Coming Down the Road, arrived in Toronto in the 69, went to work for a multinational, I was a migrant you worker. You didn't work at a pop bottle company? I didn't, I didn't, I worked all across Canada, <laughs> and I latter job I was running a division, and always had an interest personally in personal organization. I saw this program and said, aha, genius. And so, in actually, 29 years ago today, <laughs> we opened the business. Wow. So, Congratulations. today is the first day. That's how I got into it. And in those days, it was a paper-based system, but the concepts, interestingly enough, well, the world has changed so profoundly. The only difference, this was when fax machines were still science fiction, but the basic concepts mm -hmm. haven't changed of how the brain works why we need a method, and whether the, whether the follow-up system is paper or electronic, those aren't the issues. Mm -hmm. So it's been a fascinating career with so much change and yet so little change. You know, I wonder what the, because you've been in it for so long, and w when you started there was no e email even. That's correct. And, uh, and now emails come, and now I think even email is getting to the stage where it's, um, uh, it's, it's invert, it's less effective like it, for a while it was solving a lot of problems, now it almost seems to be creating more problems than it's solving because the amount of emails that people have to deal with every day, mm -hmm. it, it seems to be almost hitting a, it's hitting a, an inversion point or whatever. What, what I call the unintended consequences. I love that in, in society. So the unintended consequence email, the average person now getting 80 a day. We have almost no time and the tragedy is somehow we got seduced or brainwashed into leaving email open and checking it every time one comes in. Mm -hmm. First point, turn it off. Check it hourly. Emergencies shouldn't come by email. 
So the unintended consequence is people now procrastinate to the last second on the understanding that we can an email, and productivity across the broad macro is not increasing. So it's not the technology, it's the way we've let it get out of control. Mm -hmm. And yes, I've got companies now where it's, it's out of control, mm -hmm. but nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Then of course people say, well, let's go to instant messaging. Now I can procrastinate to the last second instead of the last minute. Unintended yeah. consequences. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, sometimes you, you talk about the clean desk and you know, sometimes you see pictures of offices from the 70s or earlier and they didn't even have computers on them. Right. And, you th and I think, what were those people doing? Things, <laughs> ran, things ran quite well. Yeah. Not, not so similar. But so there was a number of things. We, we thought ahead. Uh, you couldn't leave it till the last second. And things were actually shockingly productive mm -hmm. if you take a look at the broad macro figures mm -hmm. with those. So, so well, okay, so we, we talked about email briefly, but I in this business, what do you see as some broad trends in terms of um, the issues that people are dealing with that may affect their priority management? Uh, several things. One that hasn't changed, and this is part of the workshop, is getting folks to understand the difference between urgent and important. Mm -hmm. Urgent and important are not synonyms. And so, but I, yet I hear people constantly, unconsciously saying, I need to do X, it's urgent, I need to do X, it's important. I say, well, which is it? I say, well, what do you mean? You use the two words. Urgent is a connotation of time. Yeah. So when we set a day up, yeah. we need to be able to look and say, what is it that absolutely has to be done today? A priority, high priority, whatever you want to put on it. Yeah. And then we have what could wait. Well, you know, when you mention those, I always think of that, there's a, you know, it's a two axis chart. One's urgent. Matrix. Urgence and urgency and one's importance. Right. And you can plot everything on that graph. I changed want. it. I found that it had little value for folks and I changed important to value added. That then becomes quantitative, objective rather than subjective. And so the top corner remains urgent, high value added, we're paid to value add, it's tragic the number of people don't even know what value added means. And fixing a problem doesn't add value. Fixing a problem is necessary negative value. And so trying to get people out of the crisis management mm -hmm. mode mm -hmm. of dealing with crisis, recognizing they can be avoided. So what are the other trends? People are working longer hours. So. 20 years ago, they were telling us to buy shares in a marine or a ski resort because with all the technology, we were going to have a 40, uh, we're going down to the 32 hour week. Well, how are we making it with that? Yep. We got it in by Wednesday. <coughs> and in actual fact, the number of hours worked has gone up. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the trends, people are looking for work-life balance. Mm -hmm. But they don't know how to find it. Mm. There's so many demands at work, a great many of which are unnecessary, that, that the research from ourselves and going back to Drucker's work would indicate that, the, that hard working, intelligent, dedicated people waste roughly a quarter of their day on a variety of what we call productivity pirates. So th the trends are people are desperately looking for methodologies mm -hmm. to not have a messy desk, crisis management, endless interruptions, poor delegation skills and ineffective meetings. Those are some of the trends here, if that answers at all. What about, um, I mean, you, you talk about we, we, we're, for the first time, we, we have this knowledge economy where more people's yes. work is, no, is knowledge workers. Um, one of the things I noticed too, it seems that uh, people are tending to be more entrepreneurial, not necessarily out of choice, but you know, the, the jobs working for large companies, those seem to be disappearing and more and more people seem to be moving towards self-employment in some ways. Well, what absolutely is disappearing is the manual labor jobs. So the statistics there, I mean, farming is the most classic one. A hundred years ago today, every second person in Canada was on a farm. Today it's 2%, pushing three. So we've had this incredible transformation away from farming being manual labor to where it's now done one farmer feeding one family to one farmer feeding 40. Mm -hmm. Now, the other, the jobs, we've moved away from the factory. The manual labor in the factories has gone overseas to low cost. Mm -hmm. There's an endless amount of, of things for people that are entrepreneurial. Can value add 
in a knowledge-based economy. Yeah, so those trends there, absolutely. Uh, with the technology, there's less need for people to move information up and down that hierarchy, mm -hmm. so more the people have to be bringing true value to the organization. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or, or, or in their business. Or in their if business. If they're a self-employed entrepreneur, Absolutely. they just have to, that's, that is the business, that is adding the value, business. Right? right? And then understanding what value added means and understanding that the whole thing out there today, well, in order to run a small business, you have to work 16 hours a day when you've got clutter all over the place yeah. are missing things. Yeah. Yes, you do. With your act together, you don't. Do you think, uh, do you think we're, we're doing a better or worse job in general today in managing our priorities than we did when you started this business 29 years ago? That's an interesting question. There's a higher awareness, but my concern is the tremendously detrimental effect that the technology's had. Mm -hmm. that, Just because it's such a yes, distraction? Yes, that the, the interruptions now. Yeah. So that the ability that, that, you know, we'll say that the average person is interrupted 160 times a day. They have three minutes to work on any given task that we need to stop and say, now what's next? So that, and, and it's not the technology. What did we do before telephones? We still had a productive economy. Mm -hmm. But it's learning to manage the technology and not let the technology tail wag the value-added productivity dog. So one of the things I see for the listeners, you go into a meeting and people actually have their Blackberries turned on and checking it. How incredibly rude. Mm -hmm. It's totally unacceptable. How can we run an effective meeting when half the group is tuned out looking at the latest joke in the Blackberry prayer? So turn it off. And we need, rather than this constant interruptions, we need FTF, FF. I thought we needed FTF, FF. First things first, focus and finish. First things first, focus and finish. Now what's first things first? I leave that to people to decide what's in, what matters in their life. Mm -hmm. But the opposite of that is people are doing the quick, fun, and easy, not first things first, and there's no focus because of the constant interruption, and there's an endless stream of half-finished tasks and projects. Mm -hmm. Solution? Take control. Turn email off. Plan the day. People don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. Everybody has an excuse why they're different and they can't plan their day. I'm not buying it. But the biggest point when I talk about planning the day is you have to plan for the unexpected. The basic rule is that 80% of the day is gone before we show up at work. Because we've got 100 emails, there's an hour and a half. We've got 17 phone calls, there's another hour. And we've got the problems interruptions. So we can plan. But we need a plan based on our own reality not on some fairy tale idea that we've got eight hours of uninterrupted time and, and the real world doesn't exist. So that plan needs to, as you say, take into account the unexpected. Be, right. Yeah. And if we're driving, we have to accept the fact that there's going to be traffic that doesn't move at the perfect rate. Yeah. That's, and it seems like common sense, mm -hmm. but it isn't. Yeah, <coughs> interesting. So where are you taking your company now with, you know, you mentioned Outlook and you, you've got other seminars you, you teach, which no, are? No, actually, it's, if you go back to the Jim okay. Collins book, Good to Great, what are we good at? Mm -hmm. We're good at workload management, work-life balance. Yes, okay. we do a few other things, but they're there more than when there's, when there's an issue, fine. But the majority, mm -hmm. Hilton, is we've stayed focused. Okay. Uh, persistence, if you will, all the classics about persistence, the number yeah. one key. And, and so, uh, now, uh, dealing with change. Several years ago, I could turn, couldn't turn a computer on. I had a choice. Get with the program. Old people can learn. We learn faster, actually, because we know how to learn. And now 95% of the work is using computers. That's fine. Mm -hmm. It's just that we, it was adapt like every other business. It was a choice of adapting. Mm -hmm. Fine. Change when you understand it can be fun. Mm -hmm. And it's exhilarating then to have transitioned the entire business from mm -hmm. a paper-based to a technology-based, and it rolls along much the same as ever. Okay. So. You know, and is there a need for it? There's a need for this type of training almost in perpetuity, as far as I can see. Yes. That regardless of the tool, mm -hmm. that we still need the understanding of mm -hmm. the concept I've talked about. Does that, have I answered yeah, that? Very much so. So just speaking of another tool, for instance, um, you know, uh, uh, Google Plus. Mm -hmm. So they have a whole system that's not Outlook. 
Mm-hmm. You know, is that something that you're also embracing we're, or using? And, look, and, look, and looking at it, we're saying, that, you know, do we need the program, the learning guide written for that as well? Yes. But it's this, you see, and I, what I stress is it's the process, not the tool. Yes. Mm-hmm. People get confused. No, it's the process. So what I've talked about, clean desk, empty inbox, to-dos in one place, the brain can't remember in the future. Whether it's an iPhone, a Mac, Outlook, that's not the issue. Mm-hmm. Daytimer, whatever. It's understanding the concepts, understanding urgent versus important, understanding data activating, understanding the detrimental impact of clutter. Mm-hmm. Those are the issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, can it be done on the back of an envelope? In certain cases, yes. It's yes. the process right. without being unduly simplistic mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. But that's what I stress is it's not the... So Google, absolutely. There's a yeah. there's number there. Yeah. It seems that you, like you've got, as I've listened to you again, you know, and, and have in the past, you know, I, I hear all the knowledge, you know, and not just knowledge that, that is uh, important and right, but also wisdom in terms of, oh, I see you living it, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so more practice, you know, more consistency. And in some cases we need reminders. <laughs> yes. there's a, and there's different personalities to it, that doesn't mean we're not effective, but uh, yes. anyway. Yes, yes. Those are some of the concepts. Yeah. Now, so it sort of sounds like, you know, we as a, an economy, a society might be suffering a little bit from our inability to keep up with our priority management as our technology has, has evolved a little bit. In other words, we might be doing a little bit worse than we were 29 years ago. I'm not people a, what are we doing worse, but we're certainly leaving an incredible amount of productivity. So. <laughs> When, I, when I'm running the workshops, I talk about the parallel between factory work and knowledge work. Factories have increased productivity 4% a year for decades. And factories, so I say the top of your desk is a factory floor raised 30 inches. Mm-hmm. Now, Peter Drucker, probably the foremost writer on mm-hmm. management, business, unless we can figure out a way to increase the productivity of our knowledge workers and increase it quickly, yeah. the Western societies, economies face economic stagnation and severe social tension. What do we got over in the park? The 1%, 99%. Social tension, economic stagnation. So the statistics are all over the paper in the last month or so that adjusted for inflation, there's practically no increase in our take home pay of the bottom 99%. And what drives me crazy is that the work I do, you know, what would it do if we added a 5% increase to the gross domestic part of the country? And you see, you see, everybody laughs, but Drucker's point that a, that a messy desk, crisis management, endless interruptions are not a minor irritation, they're a massive problem. The messy or, desk is a threat it, to it, Western it, civilization. It, look, the productivity, if we ran factories, try to think of running factories the way we run offices. Drucker says we're 50 years behind the factory. I agree. Now factories have lean manufacturing. They have, factories are anal. They have total quality management. What I do is the lean manufacturing for knowledge workers. Now factories are constant. How do we do it better? How do we do it quicker? Knowledge workers have, are resistant to the change. Mm. So, you know, we spend, a, the average person in Canada spends a half an hour a day trying to find pieces of information that are on, in, around, under, behind their desk, and they brag about it. Mm. Okay, information is the raw material. Where does the factory put the raw material? Duh, in a warehouse. How do they find it? An inventory control system, duh. Mm. What's that for us? It's a filing system. Can you get people to do it? No. They'd sooner waste three weeks of their year looking for things on the desk than take a couple of hours and build a filing system. So yes, I mean, I get passionate about it, but I watch what's going on in the world and people's lives and mistakes and and just the, the, you know, you know, the time that's wasted unnecessarily by the vast majority of our workforce. So, pardon me for passion, but. Well, it sounds like if you, if, if you had the opportunity to, to work with uh, the knowledge workers across the company, or across the country, that we'd see, uh, you know, it would turn the economy around. It, is 5% enough to make a huge difference? It's a chunk of money. So, now, who do you work with? Do you work with individuals? Do you work with companies? What uh, who can take advantage so of this? What incredibly interesting is that on one of the workshops, and I do on-site private workshops for companies, I run public open workshops. And so, uh, the, the, the clientele includes the churches. So, I can have, you know, a pastor, a minister from a church, a school principal, vice president of a hospital, the chief of an Indian band, 
captain of, we're all knowledge workers. So you say, what on earth would somebody who's the sales manager for a television or radio station have in common with an Anglican minister, a school teacher, or a, the chief of an Indian man? We do exactly the same work. We talk. What do people do all day? They talk to people face to face, they talk to people on the phone, or they talk with printed symbols. Mm -hmm. So that's the interesting clientele. So it's busy people that have some element of control over what they do. That's the market. But that's what makes it so incredibly mm -hmm. interesting, mm -hmm. is that it's almost all segments of society here. Mm -hmm. From the media, to the hospitals, to the healthcare, to the education, to sports, mm -hmm. government, it's, it's more the type of job than, you know, so what's an example of what it's not applicable? A bank teller, a clerk in a supermarket. They may be incredibly busy, but they don't have that choice over what they do. Because it's already structured. Yeah, for them. It's, it's structured. Yeah, okay. That's, that's the concept more of what, of what makes it so fascinating is the incredibly eclectic variety of people that you'll come with. But, but when you think about it, it's, the, the issues are similar. It's just the vocabulary is different. Now, do you have any public... Uh, presentations that people who are checking this out might come and hear your wisdom? If they go to our website, progressivetraining.ca, and yes, we've got workshops scheduled here in the GTA on a regular basis that are open for public enrollment. We okay. also run periodically, as part of an, of an international organization, the workshops run in most of the major cities across North America, but explicitly, you know, I'm here in the GTA as well as Guelph and London. It's fabulous. So okay. progressivetraining.ca or if they just Google Andy Sherwood, they'll find me. Okay. All right. Andy, this is great. Great to have this conversation. Thank you. Thank, Thank right. you, Hilton. <laughs> and, good to uh, see you again. Thank you. Okay. So um, that was good, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to watch this interview again a few times and <laughs> take more yes. notes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Okay, so we're going to take a little break, come back with Anthony and get some live, uh, get some live uh, stuff happening right after this. LiquidLunch.channel.com. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Liquid Lunch. Uh, it's Welcome me, Hugh back. Hilton's here. And we got Anthony joining us, uh, going to bring us a little bit of music as we uh, wrap up the show today. Anthony, great to have you back on the show. It's great to be here, Hugh. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me back. Thanks for joining me. Wow. Thank you, sir. Absolutely, yes. sir. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, any new, anything new to report? Any thoughts you want to share with us before you give us your first uh, song today, Anthony? Well, you know, a fella shared something with me recently, and on a serious note first, um, about something called If. And my take on it of late, and I'm one of them too, so I could say it, is this world would be a fabulous place if only for the people. You know? It's a joke. It's my attempted humor today. It's yeah. if only for the people. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, yeah. Well, as we all try with our busy schedules to things together and, and you know musically <coughs> lately we're doing that and with the real world leaking in and number of lives that have that are taking part in uh, what it is I'm trying to do um, with this sound that I've that I have um, it's hard I mean you know we're not all on the same schedule and it's hard to take that sometimes yeah so that's what I meant by that yeah interesting okay yeah. you want to do a song for us and we'll come I back do. we'll Great. chat some more Thanks. about Thanks that so yeah. okay. what's his first song you want to do for us uh, this song is called um, For Always Meant For Me. Um, it's a song I wrote about a woman. Um, I think I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Are there any other songs, really? in love I just think that you're pretty Trying to tell you this what I'm all about And I get you to listen You wanna make a show And thinking I'm back on all of the yesterdays And touching to your head
was meant for me Never always meant for me For that special one. Thank you. Thanks. Beautifully done. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Mm. Once again, thanks for having me back. It, it did sound good. Is that a new song? Something recent? or? It's got a few new twists to it. I've been yeah. tinkering it for a little bit. A little bit. Um, I've always been tinkering it for too long when you're a songwriter. It's, like, <laughs> you know, it's never quite finished. Yeah. Although you are, but it's not, apparently. It, somehow that works. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Until you I mean, finally one day get to record it. And then you can kind of leave it We're doing and that move on now. to the next one, right? Yeah, right, right, yeah, where you can say it's done. I mean, yeah, well, I'm bed tracking a bunch of this stuff right now and uh, throwing some sounds at it, getting some playback, bed, bed tracking it, using it as a songwriting tool. Mm -hmm. Try to see how, if I can maintain the dynamics of it in that process. And when you envision doing the recordings, right. like are you envisioning a full rock band, like a four piece, or, or what kind of instrumentation do you envision for bringing these songs right. to full fruition right well including myself I, I see five anyhow I see uh, you know you have your percussion drummer and uh, bass player uh, you know a lead guitarist rhythm guitar obviously it's, you know some backing vocals um, and I've, I've experimented bouncing some harp off at some harmonica and it's fabulous as well and that's going to be right there too um, be interesting if and how it unfolds because um, I do see a full sound mm -hmm. you know and it's in one sense easier done recording because you can pull things in and out as you require them performing it and um, furthering your message through music like I say performing it is, is, is a different animal mm -hmm. uh, you want to include all those sounds along the way mm -hmm. so it's, you know that's the challenge of it for me Beyond missing one shoe here, that's a challenge of it for me. <laughs> yeah, like that. Do you have any songs with bagpipe in it? <laughs> 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 I got one with, uh, I do have one that has bagpipe in it, but you, like I, I hear what you're saying because, you know, I can't go out and hire a bagpipe player because I, then he's going to want to expect to play on every song. Right, of course. Uh, yes. But, you know, <laughs> if you can do real well with that one tune, you can afford to have them sit in the wings. You know. And that is why I asked Hamish about that, by the way. Yes, right, yes. Right. Right. I guess we will have to find a, a bagpiper will have to find us <laughs> and come well, forward. You know, when I see, for that particular tune, I see a classical concerto, I guess they say, you know, a pianist, a concert pianist, classics with an intro and an outro for that tune strictly but a different intro from the outro yeah you know that's you know i i just got that ringing around my pea brain you know, like that man yeah all right you want to do another one for sure us sure do man thanks what's this one started talking about music and forgetting where the heck i was <laughs> yeah, man. uh this tune uh this tune is um i toyed around with parts of this uh, the first time i was here um i'm going to give you the <coughs> full-on message it's called the unfortunate few and it's about a few friends of mine men and women that um for one reason or another, find themselves in a place called the ramp. Um, it's a place where, you know, as you meet the door of the ramp, the building that holds the ramp, you're going up, there's an incline there, and I've said it before, and once again, I'm repeating myself, but it's important to me. It's a place where the last thing you feel is that you're going up. So it's a hard climb for some of my friends. This is called the unfortunate few for those boys and girls like that. Throw a quick tune on this.
buddy. And brother and sister, uh huh. And all the things you see, sir, you still don't see me, uh huh. Long lines of food trees and think like a preacher, uh huh. Church, state, faith, and faith, the unfortunate few, uh huh. You see, church, state, faith, and faith, the unfortunate few. Uh huh. So I'm locking back sound. Uh huh. I'm locking back pain. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Lost in a world of illusion. Mm -hmm. Friends who don't play the same game. Don't you see the intrusion? Mm -hmm. Locked down from life every day. Mm -hmm. Locked down from life every day. Mm -hmm. So you can't see through rain. Mm -hmm. So you can't see through rain. broken string and all. Yes, awesome. Sir. But uh, thank you for getting it, sir. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you so much. On behalf of my friends. Yeah. You know, you know, Anthony, I, I don't know if I missed it the last time you were talking about right. you, the last time you're here, but what is this building or whatever it is with the ramp that you're talking about? The building is, this building is a place where Men go, it seems, I did, when they had nowhere else to go. There was nowhere else to go. As a matter of fact, if you don't get to the ramp on time, you can't even go in there. And then, <laughs> then there's somewhere to go because you'll end up somewhere, but it certainly won't be of your choice or a place mm -hmm. you'd want to be. So, um, yeah, the ramp is a place people go when they have nowhere to go. Um, when I arrived at the ramp myself, uh, I, I couldn't say that I was lonely, but I was definitely alone. There's no question about that. I still feel that here. Like, I, I mean, when you talk about a place to go when there's, um, <coughs> when you don't get to the ramp on time. Right. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of homeless, there's a lot of homeless people in the city of Toronto and, and, all, and all over the country. Right. And I, it seems to me, I remember a time when it, that situation just didn't exist. And I'm wondering if you've got <coughs> any thoughts on that. You can stand in the city of Toronto at the corner of Dundas and George Street. And you can look north up George Street. 
Looks like a movie of the week to me. You can turn, quarter turn, and you can look to the horizon, so to speak, which linear is about a 12 minute walk. And you can look at the silhouette of the, some of the most pristine cut buildings I've ever seen. I used to think they're pretty good looking. I don't see them as that anymore. My take on homelessness is parts of it seem to be to me contrived. Maybe on purpose, maybe indirectly, maybe it's human nature. I just think we gotta start seeing each other as equals. And that we're all on this rock together hurling through space. All of us. All of us. And the package is a distraction so you can grab onto faith and make it mean something. Because it was easiest to happen on this table beside me really wouldn't be much of a word to really hang on to now, would it? <coughs> it's kind of like that, I guess. Sorry. Bit of a flooding answer. Okay. Right. No, no worries. Struck a curve. Struck a... Struck a struck a nerve with me here. I didn't I don't have many left, so I was searching for the word. <coughs> like that. All right, we got time for one more song. You want to do one for sure us? Sure I do. We'll pick a five string number. <laughs> Generally you play them with Creative six. on the move. Yeah, yes, sir. Just I, I broke the bass strings before. Oh man. Anthony. And had to deal with it. You had to keep keep going, you know? You know you I'm liking you more all the time. You're breaking bass strings? Gosh, <laughs> what a feather in your cap. I want to try that. I'm going to pick up the bass just so I can break some of it. Because that, you know, that's, that takes some doing. Um, I'm going to do a five-string tune. I have a friend here today. Her friend is Donna. Come on up, Donna. She's a friend of mine. She's going to play a little tambourine for this tune. I, heard, I thought I heard the tambourine yeah. a little earlier. Hi, Donna. Welcome. Another original tune. Gosh damn it. Uh, there we go. Thanks, anyway. Sweetness. Thanks for seeing us all. Awesome. We see you we see you too, kid. You know, my friend. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> I just gotta tell you, know, Anthony. It took, it took some tuning to get him to do that. I'll do anything for attention pretty much. We see you too. You know my, my guitar uh, my friend Ken, who play who I play guitar with. He broke strings all the time. And you know what he did? Right. Just I don't know if this will help, Anthony, because I know you're playing with such passi okay, passion, but, so but he switched to a heavier gauge. And he said his problems have uh, disappeared. Um, I yeah. don't know if that's going to help. but uh, well, I switched to a heavy gauge, or gauge yesterday. <laughs> <so you laughs> uh, <forgot laughs> uh, Maybe they got us. <laughs> yeah, the result, yeah. Well, perhaps I should pick another instrument. You know, <laughs> you know for that <laughs> message through music like that. Okay. So, okay, so what's coming up? Any performances? Uh, I know you were uh, trying to get to the supermarket. I don't know if you did, but uh, w what do you got on the I horizon? I make it in there. It was, uh, it was a nice, nice evening, great place to play. Uh, the guys that run that uh, show, Steve and Tony, on a Sunday evening, I'll tell you. It's got a lot of energy in there. I love it in there. Yeah, it went well. Um, for me, it's like this, Hugh. 
I'm hoping that it comes to find you and that you don't have to go looking for it. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for my message on behalf of the unfortunate few and the unfortunate many yeah. roaming this globe of ours. Yeah. Come looking for you. And uh, hopefully that won't be a difficult thing for it to find you. That's my... All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for coming in today thanks and so doing much. this. And... Uh, and uh, we are going to probably be playing at some point. So uh, it seems we are looking forward sir. to uh, that happening yeah. at some point. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That's a that you have my word on that. All right. Yeah. Okay. Anthony. I'm looking forward to it. He really am. Okay. Thanks, yeah. man. All right. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. Okay. Thank you for having me back. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Majovic. Okay. And I guess that's the show, A. Hilton, mm -hmm. for a another Tuesday here on Liquid Lunch. Brief and great. Brief and great. You did a good job. Great job. Thank you. <laughs> and, and you. And you. Woo! And Donna even likes it. Donna, thank you. Okay, thank you, Donna. Peace. So uh, we'll just uh, say uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow at m noon for more Liquid Lunch right here on thatchannel.com. See you then. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>